Well, hello, uh, Mhotep, and welcome, uh, Smog Morgan, uh, for the Egyptian Magic Podcast. And today I'm editing together a few different bits and pieces to illustrate a, a very important theme within, perhaps the most important theme within, uh, Egyptian magic in the past and in its revised version. Okay, so today in the month of Osiris, uh, I'm exploring some of the mysteries primarily connected with Osiris, but I should say in the last episode, let's start there. In, in the last episode, I kind of introduced a, a theme of uh, the transfer of the cult of Isis from Egypt to India, which is a very long story, and I'm going to kind of come back to it in various phases. And I think I finished the last one by uh, promising, in a way, that I was that I would be filming from a very special site in Egypt, uh, which threw, threw some particular light on this, but. As things happen, the best laid plans, as they say, uh, don't always come to pass. And for one reason or another, uh, partly connected with the kind of major crisis in humanity taking place at the moment with the uh, atrocities in uh, Israel and the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. It, it just wasn't... Uh, safe we were advised that we couldn't go uh to egypt really not safely uh for us particularly so th which is rather disappointing but as it happens i do have quite a lot of other i was going to talk about a particular site and i've visited this site before and i do have some material from the site and i have some uh insights and photographs that other people uh egyptologists and all the rest of it also kind of shared with connect with this site so uh, it's still worth uh discussing it's such an in a significant and important mystery uh, i should say many times in the past and in other podcasts and lots of other people talk about a thing called the osirion and again, they kind of, when people have got used to the idea of the Osirion, which is this uh, hidden chamber that exists in Abydos primarily, is the best example and the one the most visited in this kind of probably most visited sacred site in antiquity as well. And there is this underground secret chamber that lots of people have speculated about. The The thing I suppose to consider when, when thinking of the Osirion is that it's not the only one uh, even in terms of the archaeological record there are several of them they found another one on us now quite a well preserved one perhaps I'll, I'll show some pictures of that as well or, or the one or two pictures of the place that exists and there are a list of there are a few surviving bits there's one at Karnak uh, that's listed in 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 the record as being an Osirion but I guess that I hadn't thought about it at the time but essentially I was going to go and visit the Osirion in Ka on the Karnak campus although it's not really acknowledged as one they're probably more you know most huge sites obviously the site at Karnak is absolutely immense uh, it has this sort of major route in which is quite famous and you know with the huge pylon gates and everything like that but when you go further into the into the campus the bits that are open I mean probably the vast majority of the site is not actually open to the public even now because it hasn't been fully excavated and because it's too remote uh, for one reason or another Anyway, but even now, if you go into the site, you can spend quite a lot of time exploring lots of subsidiary sites within Karnak. And one of these uh, is 
and in essence is an Osirion, another Osirion I think. It's not called that, it's called the old pet. But it has an, an all, such a lot in common with this idea of the of the Osirion of the Hidden Chamber that I, I thought I should. I, I think it's fair to say that. It's been renovated and uh, well documented now. Uh, and I think the disappointing thing is it would actually be open to the public officially with a bit of time to to make my own recording of things. I was lucky enough to visit this site um, many years ago and pay a little bit of backsheesh and uh, not at my <laughs> people appear and ask you this and was able to visit it for just for a few minutes maybe for 10 minutes and take some pictures uh, which is basically what I'm going to share with some other people's pictures it should be said I prob probably will do kind of just a show just on the nature of the mystery cults, right? Because, you know, mentioning in the kind of idea of mysteries, it probably uh, is, a, is one of these subjects that needs to be discussed. The reason why I discussed this um, particular sanctuary within, uh, in the context of the book that I wrote about um, Egypt and India, the book that called Isis Goddess of Egypt and India, there you go, is because the nature of the of this site in Karnak has certain parallels with us with a site that you would find in in India. There's a kind of primarily this subterranean nature of it in the subterranean crypts. This is very distinctive part of. It's a, it's a kind of hidden secret tradition within Egypt, or it, w it certainly was, uh, and it's still a little, quite, quite uh, difficult to interpret and strange. And it's even more <laughs> uh, strange in an Indian context as well. So you, you really no, need to kind of investigate both things to see that, there's, that there really is a link. I suppose it's, it's like in you know people used to do this thing with pyramids. They kind of look at pyramids in Egypt, and then they kind of look at Egyptian, uh, Indian temple structure and say, "Oh, well, they've kind of got these pyramids on top of them as well." But there, there's a which is can there's some truth in that actually. But uh, that's not the the parallel I'm talking about. I'm talking more about subterranean structures. And the the thing to consider that. It's really set in the magical world alike, uh, one way or another. Is this notion of, um, okay, so I was talking about the hidden chamber, right? This concept, the hidden chamber or the dark chamber as it's sometimes called. The there's a whole whole book within the Egyptian tradition, more probably more than one, but there's one that sort of specifically refers to this kind of mystery, um, which would be the Amduat, which is the, the the book of what is in the hidden chamber in in lots of ways. So this this concept of the hidden hidden chamber, which is a um, a psychological thing, a mental thing, but it's also like with anything in this type of magic, there's th th there's always this um, combination of the imaginal and uh, uh, the actual physical thing, right? Uh, you very rarely find you just talk about things as a psychological or mental or meditational image. There's always a physical component to it. So, so you have the hidden chamber, you have which is this structure which we're it's going to take a lot of exploration, but one way or another, that, that idea will keep recurring. It keeps recurring to, in all sorts of traditions within people who study Egyptian magic. But strangely, when anybody talks about the modern revived form of magic, the, this notion seems very important. You have this kind of crypt of Christian Rosencrantz, for instance, that, you've, that uh, occurs within the Golden Dawn. Victorian kind of approach to magic, that, but obviously before that, which essentially is again, it's a, it's the crypt of the adepts. It's a hidden chamber, 
uh, with all sorts of strange things on it that uh, the adept kind of went into and uh, meditated at the very least, cried and underwent some sort of psychophysical transformation. And all of these things, that's, that's just one example, there are loads of different examples of this structure uh, that has been recurring throughout time, basically, from the, almost from the beginning of time, throughout the timeline. And, and the Egyptians are particularly important because they actually built various versions of this, one way or another. Anyway, this was the structure that I was going to go and visit and film a little bit more of and I will do in a few months where I, I, we're considering that we will be able to get back there and do a little bit more work on it. Originally in the in the book Isis in India I, I wrote about this as a as a site of um, initiation into into the the mysteries and as I say if you if you just take on board at the moment that the mysteries are a kind of do exist or did exist within within Egypt I, a group of people perhaps priests or perhaps just people who uh, had, had a special yearning for the mysteries of their own religion especially in the late period who banded together to form a kind of equivalent of a coven, really. I think a coven is a kind of better way of looking at it rather than a so Masonic thing. Oh, the Masonic Lodge is probably another version of the same idea. A lodge, if you like, a collection of people <coughs> who come together to practice and learn about the inner aspects of, of religion, one way or another. So you have this structure uh, the reason why it was first identified as being a a bit different to everything <coughs> to everything else that existed uh, in the on the Karnak camp campus is because it has its own entrance. The, the, if you visit Karnak or if you look at films of Karnak, there is one huge ceremonial entrance to the site that everybody. Uh, comes in through uh, where the main ticket office used to be and uh, th where that amazing kind of uh, set of colossal pillars and the, the pylons that assist and you can go through and that's orientated also to the rising sun. And so that's the, the main entrance or, or one of the, the, the largest ceremonial entrances to the Karnak site Basically, you'll move into the site, moving towards from from west to east, uh, on that major kind of solar alignment. And strangely, if you if you if you travel a few miles away across the Nile to the to the west bank of uh, of Luxor, and to the the famous Temple of Hatshepsut which also forms a kind of natural observatory. And even though it's about kind of couple of miles away you can see from the <coughs> terrace of the temple of Hatshepsut where there is another kind of solar observatory type thing in in play you can see the the pylons of the the, the main entrance of Karnak in the distance you know because they're so colossal you can't really miss them so you've got that structure and and that orientation going from west into east so that the, this other gateway that goes through so the whole site has a kind of ceremonial wall around it called a temenos and it's always significant if there are entrances extra entrances going through the temenos that that they didn't just bash them through that they, they have to be have a special um, magical component to them as well and so this has got its own entrance. So it's, uh, it, it's assumed from that that outside of the kind of regular liturgy and ritual of the temple itself uh, and the major festival work and, and all the rest, which probably involved huge crowds at certain times, but certainly huge crowds of priests as well, 
performing all this liturgy, perhaps outside of hours uh, of the normal day or ritual day of, of, of the temple complex, people had the ability to enter into this special space. And that was one of the first things people noticed. It has its own entrance and uh, and that shares the major entrance of the whole site as well, right? So it's kind of quoting it, but it's it's different. So so this is why people think that this was an uh, has a special use, and this entrance also has some quite personal bits of ritual that could be um, done in in. In connection with this, it has a certain pacing on, on a more, much more human scale. What, what the the entrance to the main temple at Karnak is is colossal, you know. So it's, it's kind of everything's on a much on a huge scale, uh, whereas this is kind of much more human scale. Just a few people, and there are ritual acts that you're encouraged to to make as you enter the temple that. <clears throat> that are much more kind of individual right? and this sort of thing is is the sort of stuff that kind of definitely interests us more or or well, no the other stuff is interesting as well but this is kind of um special in its own way as well so you enter into the temple as an example of that, there's a there's a immediately as you go in through this this own door, there is a there is a there's an outdoor altar, uh, sacred to the goddess Sekhmet, and this altar is in a way almost like an oven. <laughs> it's an it's a place for the making of burnt offerings, so things can be offered to the goddess Sekhmet, and they actually can be burnt on this special um placement in front of her altar and that's almost like the it's right there at the entrance just as you go in it could be that it's the statue of segment i don't think is, is actually in place anymore the altar is there though uh, i suppose the question is is this something that you do as you enter into the uh the sacred space or was it something it was it the thing that you did at the end or perhaps both and I, I say that because there's, there's this thing that, you you know, you make offerings and stuff in, in temples of all sorts and, uh, and do rituals as well. Uh, especially when you do group rituals, they're, they're the things that are left over, uh, the remnants of the offerings and the, maybe the wax images and the, the, the lamp oil and uh, all sorts of other things. There's always an issue in magic of what do you do with the, with those sort of things. If you just kind of, it's not the sort of thing you can just throw in, throw in the trash or whatever. You have to, or if you do that, you have to do it in a special way. So, so often uh, temples have a, a special place for the ritual disposal of objects, and it this could also fit, or fit with that. Um, that need in one way or another so it could be something that's done it when as you enter or something when you when you leave it's, it it's certainly so we learn from that as well or we it, you know it reinforces something we already know is that you probably do have to have um some sort of facility for dealing with the leftovers of a, of a ritual Often, you know, you, you find this on ritual sites as well. One of the things that people, one possibility is, is what you know that people break all the objects, the rich, the ritual bowls and all the rest. They magically, they they physically break them in order to kind of end their existence in them in the magical right. And they they may be made of semi, not not particularly precious substances from our point of view. Uh, you know, sort of clay, simple clay objects that that can be broken at, at the end of an object without too much waste. And you, this is the same as well with things like mummification and all the rest. The kind of the cleaning products, if you like, that you may be used in the process of mummification themselves have to be disposed of. But 
you know there, there's a limit to this sort of stuff there's a you have to be a bit pragmatic about it well i, I was listening to a lecture that i think last weekend about um consecration of objects and it, it made me think that someone had told me ages ago that the key the key of solomon or some of the grimoires are full of these never-ending sequence of of uh, consecration so you consecrate your i don't know your uh your magical knife or whatever it is with a special ritual with special water but the water that you use maybe that has to be consecrated and in order to consecrate it you have to have it in a in a special bowl in order to consecrate it and maybe that has to be consecrated as well and if you, if you see what I mean you could have a infinite regress in terms of at one point do you do you stop consecrating things and accept you have to start somewhere right you have to accept the tension that you know maybe you can so it's intention is probably more important than absolutely everything okay so you get into the site and these days, obviously, as with a lot of archaeological sites, an awful lot of it has been destroyed or reused. Uh, the stonework has been used somewhere else. But there is a kind of quite a... The, the, the main centre of the of this Osarion, for want of a better word, this the Opet shrine, is um, still does survive quite well. And it's actually got... Inside it's got all of its um, colour uh, paintings on the on the wall, which are very mysterious and difficult to interpret, and of course we've got a lot of trouble um, working out what they what they are. And this this structure um, is uh, also underground. It also has several crypt spaces that assist underground um, following this. This has a kind of a triple structure really, a central area and, and then two side chapels. And they're not organized in, in, in a fair, in a straightforward way. There's, there's a certain labyrinthine quality to it. And there are also these, uh, these crypts uh, and, under the floor. And these these spaces under the floor have various functions. Some some of them might might just be storage of the ritual objects that have to be put somewhere, especially if some of them are semi precious objects. Uh, uh, but some of them, I should say that some of the underground structures in here, the entrance to them is not through the not through this front door, so we can enter into this structure into the main orientation of the shrine as shown on on the uh, on the plan and probably uh, as i say i'm doing this from memory now and uh, i might uh, record a little bit more as i look at the pictures to sort of show the interpretation of them because it is quite tricky to get your head around it but but basically you're entering into the in this structure from moving from the west to towards the east in the orientation to make things even more complicated uh, there's a very famous and well-preserved temple of the god Khonsu who was one of the uh, of the triad of deities of the whole site at, at Karnak which is uh, the local deities Amun, Mut the mother goddess and Khonsu their child and being the child of uh, Mutanamun uh, uh, in this solar aspect as well, he's got his own temple, uh, which is very, very well preserved. It's not on the same scale as some of the other uh, structures on the site, but it is still fairly impressive uh, and a major archaeological site in its own right. But as if to kind of give an indication of how complicated these things are right next to it is another shrine set at another angle which is the one we're talking about which is this kind of resurrection chamber this uh, mini osarion or temple of the and chamber of the mysteries the hidden chamber 
a hidden chamber. I'm sure that there may well be others on the site as well, um, yet to be discovered or, or assisting in fragmentary form. The, the, the strange thing is, is that the temple, or even more complicated, the temple of uh, Konsu has a sort of connection, a, a passageway that leads it into this other mystery place. There's another way in. Uh, and if you go to the side of the uh, temple of, of Konsu, you can see this, this doorway. Um, and in my picture, there's still lots of scaffolding around it, so it's difficult to get it, get a picture of it. And at the time I visited this and took this picture of, of this rather nice doorway, I kind of just assumed it was the back door to the main shri uh, shrine, to the Opet shrine. But I since found, since, from looking at the map, that this is actually, all this doorway does is lead into the, into the crypt. Uh, it goes down into the crypt. It doesn't lead into the, the, the main shrine at all, or it, it probably does now because so many of the walls have been kind of knocked through and everything to make it easier to move around. And some of the kind of quite tricky doorways in this, the sliding doors, metal doors and everything that kind of interconnected. It's just like a kind of Indiana Jones type place but being metallic uh, bronze structures in uh, Greek times, they, they haven't really survived, although you can, see, you can see the traces of the, of the most of the precious metalwork that existed in this shrine, and um, probably this is the case elsewhere, has not really survived because it was too easy to go and melt it down, or some of it might have ended up in, in museums without really knowing where it, where it, it originated. So that so I now know that that ornamental doorway, which I found really really fascinating anyway, because of the sort of thing, it leads into this crypt. So it's suggesting that there are certainly more than one way, right, to get to this structure, or that the structure as above, so below. Maybe there were things happening in this structure underneath, and things happening above it in on the main floor of the temple some of the details of this we can only guess at but the what i suggested in originally in my discussion of uh, of this structure that it the underground bit may have been used in the process of initiation which which involves some sort of uh stay by the initiate in in the underground secret chamber so that's one of the functions of the of the hidden chamber would have been or the dark chamber would have been initiation uh, people would have prepared for this by knowing the sacred text and there would be certain uh, of the carvings so when you when you're in the, the hidden chamber say the one we know from the one at Abydos you're kind of surrounded by a, a corpus, a, a collection of different uh, magical texts, special or religious texts, that are put in their appropriate quarters uh, around you on the walls. You've got the, basically you've got the four walls around you, and w w whichever wall is used for the particular text, that will, that will also be significant for the orientation of the, of the whole thing and for your psychophysical orientation as well. And the similar thing pro happens there. So you, you would read written copies of these things. I, I think you, we can assume that you wouldn't um, necessarily um, wait until you're on your initiation night before you start reading the... Um, all of these quite complicated texts. It's the sort of thing that you study, which is the way magical systems tend to work. You study a text and you meditate on it over a long period of time uh, as building up to things. So that, and uh, the objects, the objects are kind of ways of triggering memories of these texts as well. So, you, you, you know, I always thought this was quite, uh, 
I don't know, I didn't initially find this a very attractive form of magic, and I'm not sure if I'm necessarily a, a, a saying that you would do it this way. But the Golden Dawn had this very, very complicated system, and you had to, it's almost like you, you couldn't just hold an object, you had to hold it in a certain way, and with maybe a certain finger or whatever, touching a certain glyph on the, on the wand and all this sort of stuff. And I guess if you've prepared yourself a long time for this sort of stuff, the, these things act as triggers for experiences, which is what the point of them would be, I was thought. Anyway, I suggested, based on accounts of initiations into this, this cult that exist in the literature of the time, that... The, the initiate actually slept in the hidden chamber. Some people suggest they may actually have been sealed into these hidden chambers over a, a number of days. Uh, none of these things contradict each other. There are obviously different ways in which different cults might have gone about the process of initiation. You know, and, they, and, and there's a suggestion that people may have taken some sort of psychoactive substance uh, to to facilitate this process of almost like being sealed in, not, buried alive maybe sounds a bit um, over the top, although the, the, the texts, the funeral texts, do say that they're for the living and the dead, so it was implied the living may have participated in these structure, uh, these uh, practices in some way or another. Okay, so we're you can see how we can already go off on quite a complicated uh, tangent quite easily. But I suggested that the first use of the of these crypts as these underground structures could be things like you, you spend the night there or several nights there uh, meditating in a kind of altered state bringing together all the different things that you've learned from, read from books and, you know, at the end of the period you, the, you'd have a, a assistance, people who assisted you through through this process, hence the the other entrances to the, to the thing so that they can come and go uh, and, and presumably make sure you're okay. Um, they act as a kind of yeah, your spiritual midwife or assistant. This is quite a, a sort of common element to it. So you have you have that that process, and this is this building facilitates that that process. And one of the very very interesting things of many right <laughs> in the in this structure, which I'll kind of show a few more pictures of and and talk a little bit more about as well in a little while is the fact that they always had a kind of uh, a giant statue a greater than life star, a size at least double life size statue of of Osiris the one that existed in the crypt in this building was apparently um metal and gilded with gold so it's rather magnificent i suppose there's an idea that encountering this um object as in in the process of your initiation buried deep within the temple uh where it's kind of like a i mean people have compared the construction of this particular thing that i'm talking about to a kind of nuclear generator or a battery of some sort because of the fact that it has these number of different cells within it plus these the, these objects these these uh very complex constructed objects that kind of are not there for everybody to see. They're there for a special purpose, uh, not to be, may not even be seen at all. This is a quite an important theme within the Egyptian magic, and certainly there, there, there was uh, one of these statues. I'll, I'll show a, a, a picture, the picture of um, of a of similar buried statue that exists in one of the Osirians at the Oxyrhynchus um, archaeological site, which has been recently, within the last 10 years, I think, is continually being excavated, and they found this underground structure and this statue. 
uh, given that so many of these things exist in this form, uh, and they're not burial sites we're talking about, these are ritual sites, these are sites used by the living for some sort of um, secret r religious activity of a sort that we <laughs> want to do as well, <laughs> sort of stuff exactly that we're trying to discover and emulate. So there's the structure, I'm going to try and talk you through the basic lineaments of it using whatever plans and images and pictures that I've got um, just so that you get an idea of it. I did also suggest that the you know in the book Isis in India or all, all sorts of things that might facilitate your stay in that place but for the for the time being let's talk about that. Um, some of the images on the wall are incredible to be honest this interaction between the god Ra and the uh, god Osiris um, the, the twin sun really and again is represented here again uh, in images that people found incredibly difficult to cope with <laughs> um, especially the kind of I suppose you'd say that the almost homoerotic imagery there or the sort of sexual imagery of Ra delivering the phallus of Os Osiris. The last thing I kind of mention as a first go at this is that um, recent excavations and using new equipment, new sensing equipment and all the rest, They've actually found um, by by that it was the crypt was painted with uh, a, a, a very unusual uh, religious scene to do with the transformation of the god Amun and the different uh, aspects of the god Amun. I can only show you a sketch of that and uh, interpreting the exact meaning of that is quite complicated. But would never have been, this is actually, if you've ever sort of read any historical stuff on this, it's always tantalised, I mentioned to Indiana Jones, they always say you can't go down into the, the, the basement of this, of the old pet shrine, because ever since the 1950s, the, the, the Chinese whisper has been, because it's full of snakes. Uh, and the snakes is too dangerous to go down there and they and since that was said back in the whenever it was the 1950s or even earlier each generation has passed that knowledge on you can't go down there it's too dangerous which, which again is a very strange resonance of what you find in India as well because they say exactly the same thing when when I do introduce the structure that was transferred there uh, uh, another initiation structure in India they also say that you can't go down this because of the the danger of snakes, of, of venomous snakes and all the rest. Uh, who knows, it's, it's not unlikely, is it? But certainly I think, as far as I know now, that, that it's, it's perfectly safe. Well, as perfectly safe as almost anything can be, right, in, in, uh, in an Egyptian archaeological site. You know, it, these are, are, are rather large, often very remote places. So, so there you go. There's, uh, they have found hidden texts there using techniques that weren't available to people before and revealed that, uh, you know, see, yet more texts. The whole building is covered with incredible texts already which are themselves difficult to interpret but the key thing that I wanted to place in your mind is this idea of the hidden chamber uh, the secret chamber or the dark chamber that is exists at the Opet in uh, Karnak and exists in several other places that we know of uh, Perhaps as many as a dozen different places are known of in a fragmentary form throughout Egypt. And presuming that in uh, Egypt's heyday, much more of them were in operation and uh, and functional, and maybe haven't survived. And many of them have survived and are still not completely yet explored. So we're beginning the exploration. From our point of view of magic, it's not just academic. This is a 
this is a theme uh, that you need to dream and meditate upon. That's what we would say. And lots of people are doing that. This is uh, <coughs> relevant to the the inner secrets of, of, of Egyptian magic and religion of all times. But once you know about it, you'll see this theme recurring in all sorts of unexpected places. And indeed, even in... Uh, I don't know, in my part of the world, in Christian literature, there's always a mystery about the things that are not just there, but the things that are kind of hidden underneath the floor in the crypt of... Well, maybe I should call this talk Tales from the Crypt. Uh, and why not? You know, this, this is, is, the, is the heart of the matter, really, the womb. The secret womb is another way of looking at the temple. Anyway, I'll leave it there and I'll come back uh, with and talk about some of the images if need be uh, to, to, to introduce this image. And so there's, a fir there's another foray into the, the theme of the transfer and the connection between Egypt and India that is quite unexpected and quite productive, I think, to our work. So thanks for listening to this bit and speak to you later.